right, all right. When was that, Tan? That was January of last year? Of 2020. January of 2020. And you might remember that COVID kind of began to make its entrance around February, March or so. So that was really a prophetic word, wasn't it? Uh, that God was going to, the enemy was going to try us to try to convince us that God wasn't good and God didn't have our best interest at heart. And uh, it's been some tough time, and, and, but God is good. Uh, as we used to say in Promise Keepers, all the time. And all the time, God is good. Really, we're in a series about the goodness of God, actually. Uh, it's, it's called Let's Talk About Grace. This is actually the third message, but uh, the fourth, <laughs> the third uh, subject, but the fourth message. I kind of, you know, get a little long every now and then, but um, anyway, we've talked about the point of the series, the point of, of, of what we're looking at is that you cannot uh, get closer to God than your concept of God will allow. If your concept of God is that he's a mean ogre that sits in heaven and wants nothing to do with us, then you're not gonna come close to him. If you're convinced that he's out to get you and that he's judgmental and harsh, then you're not gonna get close to him. God created us for a relationship. He wants to be close to us. He pursues this relationship. It's a love relationship. And he pursues it with all of his might. And yet it, it, it requires that we, the loved, cooperate and allow him to be close to us. We, we are to come into his presence, the Bible says. Hebrews 4 says, um, uh, don't, be, uh, don't be afraid because we have a great high priest who has been touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was without sin. And then he says, therefore, come boldly to the throne of grace that you might obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So that, that, this is what God wants. So it's, it, it's, it's critical that we have the right concept of who God is and understand how to accept his grace and walk in his grace. And so thus a series, let's talk about grace. First, in the first topic, and I'm just gonna hit this very briefly, scan. Christianity is not a religion. Did you know that our God is the only God in the entire religious world? And I'm using that term religious. Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a relationship. Religion is trying to work your way to God by following a bunch of rules, laws, and getting credit and so forth. Christianity is God reaching down to us with grace and mercy to bring us up to himself. But our God is the only God presented in any set of beliefs anywhere that is, uh, that is merciful and gracious. All other religions, their gods are mean, angry, hostile, vengeful. You have to sacrifice to keep yourself from being uh, wiped off the face of the earth. I mean, they're just no, there's no grace whatsoever. But God says, I, here, here's what I want you to know about me. Uh, I am full of grace. The Gospel of John, chapter one, starts out with, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Everything that was made was not made without him. And then it, down in verse 14, it says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory of his only begotten father full of grace and truth. So God says, if you wanna know who I am, my, what I wanna be known for is for my grace. And then the last couple of weeks, we started looking at, all right, well, how do we understand God's heart? Because if God loves us and God is graceful and that's his most, uh, most primary virtue, then how can we understand God's heart? Because the fact is, we have a problem. God is good and we're not good. And there's no model of goodness for us. No matter how good your parents are, no matter how good your friends are, no matter how good your pastors are, your, uh, the people that had influence in your life, uh, the Bible tells us that we are not good. So we're not gonna be able to model after somebody who is good. If we're, gonna, if, we're gonna, if we're gonna understand God's heart, it's gonna be because God exposes his own heart to us. 
And this is what Moses said to God on, on Mount Sinai when he wrote the Ten Commandments and he brought them down and then the people were, were dancing around the golden calf, broke it, went back up. Moses says, are we going to, I need a, another set, God. Um, you know, those, I broke those. And God said, he was talking to Moses about taking them into the promised land, but not going with them himself because uh, they were such a stiff-necked people that he would have to destroy, blah, blah. Anyway, he, Moses looks at God and Moses says, God, would you show me your glory? Now, don't think of glory as a bright, shiny light because there is a glory that's bright, shiny. It's called Shekinah. And it's the, the cloud, the, the pillar of cloud that went by day and the pillar of fire that went by night. That was the Shekinah glory, the outward visible. When you think of glory, think about what you want to be known for. What is it that you would like to be known for? Well, you say, I have, and of course, obviously I don't, but I have beautiful hair, and, and, and my glory is my hair, or my glory is my bank account, or my glory is the mansion that I live in. In other words, when he's asked to see God's glory, he's not asking God to blow him up with this translucent light. He's asking God to show him what God wants to be known for. He says, show me what it is that is the most important thing about you, that when people see you, you want them to see this. And the scripture says, and God said, all right, Moses, stand over there in that rock. Let me put my hand here because you can't see my face and live. And I'm going to let my, I'm going to pass before you and I'm going to let you see the hind parts of me. And he did, and the Bible says, and God passed his goodness by Moses. And then God said, here's what goodness is all about. He gave seven attributes. It's merciful, it's gracious, it's long-suffering, it's abounding in goodness, abounding in truth, forgiving and just. And when Moses saw that, it changed Moses. It changed the way he worshiped. First time he ever worshiped was after that. Changed the way he thought about himself. He's valuable. God's not a God of judgment. Some ogre in heaven with a baseball bat looking to kill him every time he gets out of line. And it changed his witness because it filled him with the glory of God and, uh, and changed the way he related to other people. This is what happens when we see God as he is and we're no longer afraid and intimidated by some image of God that has been placed in us that has no uh, reality to it whatsoever. So we can come close to God. We can, we can crawl up in God's lap. We can feel comfortable with God. We're not intimidated. He's desirable to us. And he can be close. And so we're on a little campaign to try to create an image of God that the Bible presents and says, this is what God is. And, and today we're gonna talk about maybe an unusual subject uh, when you're talking about the glory of God. We're gonna talk about weakness. Uh, Am I talking to the right crowd? Uh, you have some weaknesses? Everybody? I have some weaknesses? All right, me too. All right, what, is there a purpose for those weaknesses? I mean, it, could it be, I mean, are they just happenstance? You know, it, I mean, uh, uh, did it just come upon me? Was I, uh, is it genetic? Uh, what, what, is there a purpose for my weakness? Well, we're gonna use the Apostle Paul today. And I want you to see, I don't think there's anyone stronger in the entire New Testament except Jesus than the Apostle Paul. Man, I mean, it was unbelievable. Matter of fact, I'm gonna read you a passage in just a minute. It's like his resume. Just, just so you can see, I want you, to, I want you to see this. But the Apostle Paul is, is our example today. And the Apostle Paul is being criticized by the church at Corinth. Paul formed the church at Corinth. Paul founded it. Uh, Paul worked with the people to bring them to the Lord. Uh, he had people from Macedonia paying the bills so Corinth could exist and, and, and make it as a church. So, I mean, he just did everything for the, for the church at Corinth. And then now, uh, here comes Corinth, the Corinthian church, saying some hurtful things about him. I mean, some very hurtful things. And other apostles, they're criticizing uh, Paul. So what does Paul do about it? Well, he agrees with them. <laughs> Look at it in 2 Corinthians tw chapter 12, verse one. It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. 
I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, by the way, he's talking about himself. Uh, he's in third person, but he's talking about this person who actually did what he's about to describe, and, and, it, and it's him. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body, I don't know, or whether out of the body, I don't know, God knows, such a one was called up to the third heaven. Now, that's the highest heaven. We have the heavens that the birds fly in. We have the heaven that the stars soar in. And then we have God's heaven. So I was taken up to the third heaven, he says. And, uh, and I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast, except in my infirmities. Everybody say weaknesses. So Paul said, all right, I'm not gonna brag about going to heaven and seeing all of that and, and being privileged that God would take me there and, and bring me back and blah, blah. I'm not gonna brag and that kind of stuff. The only thing I'm gonna say to you is... Um, I'm a, I have weaknesses, and it's in my weaknesses that, that I'm going to talk about. Verse 6, for though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will speak the truth, but I refrain lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me, and lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations. And let, in other words, so I wouldn't get the big head about being the spiritual star of the world. A thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that, he might, that it might depart from me, and he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities, my, my weaknesses, my frailties, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. So how does Paul handle his criticism? He agrees with them. He just doesn't try to hide. He doesn't, he doesn't try to out-talk them or, uh, or intimidate them in any way. He just says, you're exactly right. I am a weak person. I have weaknesses and I have issues that are going on in my life. And so let's just put it right out there on the table. Now, just to show you, now this doesn't, I'm not going to say anything out of these next verses. I just want to show you when Paul says, for when I am weak, then I am strong. I want you to see that he wasn't just rattling off at the mouth. I mean, he, this is his resume. This is out of the, uh, one chapter later in 2 in, in Corinthians chapter 11. Look at, here's, here's his resume. Starting in verse 23. Are they servants of the anointed one? I, I'm beside myself when I speak this way, but I'm much more of a servant than they. I have worked much harder for God, taken more beatings, have been dragged to more prisons than they. I've been flogged excessively multiple times, even to the point of death. Five times I received 39 lashes from the Jewish leaders. Now, don't, I mean, take that in. Jesus was lashed by the Jewish leaders. Jesus was scourged by the Jews and the Romans. And then he was crucified. Only person ever that was both crucified and scourged. But Paul, five times. Man, that has to be unbelievable. Once, maybe if they could catch me, five times? Man, three times I experienced being beaten with rods. Once they stoned me, and they thought he was dead, by the way. Three times I've been shipwrecked for an entire night and a day. I was adrift in the open sea. 
In my difficult travels, I faced many dangerous situations, perilous rivers, robbers, foreigners, and even my own people. I surprised, I survived every deadly peril in the city, in the wilderness, with storms at sea, and with spies posing as believers. I've toiled to the point of exhaustion and gone through many sleepless nights. I've frequently been deprived of food and water, left hungry and shivering out in the cold, lacking proper clothing, and besides these painful circumstances, I have the daily pressure of my responsibility for all the churches with a deep concern weighing heavily on my heart for their welfare. So when Paul says, uh, when I'm weak, I'm strong, I mean, he, he, he's got some street cred, doesn't he? Uh, he, he? He's got the credentials to prove it. Well, what's happening to Paul? Well, Paul is experiencing something that we all fear, and that is being criticized for our weaknesses. People observing certain tendencies, frailties, issues, and then uh, pointing them out. Now, the apostle spends three chapters in 2 Corinthians 10, 11, 12, talking about all the things that he's heard that they said about him. It's really interesting. Um, look at it, read it in the Passion Bible. That's where that came out of, uh, and unless you just love the bounce of the King James. But it, it just, you'll see, and you'll see what they criticize him by the way he answers questions. But I'll just give you one of them. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10, here's one of the criticisms that they made about Paul that he heard about. Now he's writing a letter and talking to him. Uh, verse 10, for his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful. In other words, he writes some heavy stuff when he's far away from us. He says some heavy things when he's not in our presence. That's, what they're, that's really what they're saying. For his, la for, for his letters are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech is contemptible. Now, that's not nice. Personal. What if, you were, what if you were the Apostle Paul and you had started the church in Corinth and you had sacrificed your life and your time and your effort? You paid your own way. They never did anything for you. You got the church established. You got it going. You got it as pastors. Now that it's strong, you have other apostles that are coming in trying to steal the church that you built and you loved and you care about. And not only are they doing that, they're encouraging the people to start talking negatively about you as if something is wrong with you. And, you, and, and, and so now, uh, not only are other Christian leaders criticizing Paul, but the church is saying, uh, <clears throat> Paul, you should send more letters. <laughs> uh, hey, don't worry about coming to see us so much because uh, you're not very good looking and uh, you're a bad talker. So here he is. Now, that, that's hurtful any way you look at it. I mean, <laughs> there's just no way to make that anything but hurtful. Well, what's the enemy's objective here? The enemy's objective is to control Paul's life by creating a fear of man. Now, the fear of man is certainly a weapon that the, that the devil uses to control our life. You've heard of cancel culture? Fear of man. Same old trick, just a different generation. And fear, is, and fear of, of what others say about us and what others think about us is something that, that controls our life. So any of us that are going to live for, for, for the Lord, we're going to have to decide in our own life, all right, am I going to live a life in fear of what others are going to say about me Always trying to perform right. I mean, you know, I got to get my performance because if they see my weaknesses, then they're going to start criticizing me. They're going to put me on Facebook. They're going to tweet about me or whatever that thing is. Uh, and, and it's the fear of man. And it's a real control issue. Love is the number one need of humanity. If you, in any poll, any questionnaire, any counselor's office, if you walked in and you said, what is the number one need of humanity? They would say, to be loved. All of us want to be loved. Even if we say we don't, we do. We want to be loved. So if, if, if love is the number one need of man, 
Rejection is going to be the number one fear of man. I tell you, in counseling, these 50 years of pastoring, I've, I've talked to people about all kinds of relationship issues and, and family issues and hurtful issues and work issues. And I can tell you that the number one scar in people's life is rejection. Rejection by their family, rejection by their friends. Maybe it's a spouse that rejects them or a girlfriend or a boyfriend. And see, this is Satan's hook to hook us and, and, to, and, and to control us by making us fearful of what others are going to think and say about us. And you take this vicious world we live in today and you put them on social media and we have people committing suicide. We have people that are so anxious they can't even walk around. They're full of fear and full of anxiety and full of stress because of the fear of man. They're afraid they're going to be rejected. So how do you get to the place where you can admit your weaknesses and, and live with your weaknesses? I mean, are, is there a purpose for, for weakness? Well, uh, first thing you have to do is recognize what they are. All right, so let me give you the four basic um, human weaknesses. All right, here they are. Number one, all right, inability. Inability. It means you're not able. We all have inabilities in life, right? Is there anybody in this sanctuary who doesn't have some type of inability? Where does it come from? Well, it may be that you just haven't learned anything about that. There are a lot of people that fail in marriage. It's not because they're bad people. It's just they don't know anything about marriage. People fail in finances. Why? You're not a bad person. You just don't know anything about finances. So if you don't know anything about it, it's an in, you might be unable because you don't know anything. And then second, or you might not just, you, let, me, let me get myself uh, corralled here. My tongue is moving faster than anything. <laughs> it may be that you just aren't good at it is what I'm trying to say. Because you're not good at everything, are you? I mean, as good as I am, I'm not good at everything. I know, Brian, I, don't, I didn't mean to mention that with your heart uh, trying to recover, because that's shocking, I know. But do, hey, do, do you guys have some, do you, do you guys have anything uh, that's just glaringly, you're just not good at, I mean, let's just put it that way, that you just aren't good at it? Let me tell you one of mine. Do you ever find it hard to find things at the house? I am not good at finding things at my house. Uh, in, uh, here's, here's an example. The other day, Tanya's out in the shed. She's uh, doing something with her gardening tools or something, and she's in there. And I'm in the front, and I need the water. I need the sprinkler. And so... I'm thinking, where did I last see that thing? And I pulled it out of the flower bed and took it to the shed. I remember that. So I said, well, let me go to the shed. So I went to the shed and looked. I mean, Tanya's sitting right here and her little workbench kind of thing's right here and she's just tinkering away. And I'm coming in and I'm looking all down under that thing and I'm looking over there by the rakes and shovels, all that, looking and I'm looking. I had to move a couple of things, move. And I look all over that place and that sprinkler's not there. And I go back out to the front and say, well, I knew I put it. And I looked under all the little shrubs out there. I said, and then I went in the garage where we keep a little hose parts and little uh, nozzles and stuff in a cabinet up there. I said, well, maybe I put it up there. No. I go back out to the shed. I walk around in there again, looking just like I did the first time. Go back to the garage and say, well, right, one more time. Let me go over here and look by the water heater. And then I come back to the shed and I say, Tanya, have you seen the sprinkler? She goes, there it is. <laughs> sitting right there. Here's the door coming in. Here's the sprinkler sitting up this high. I mean, right almost at eye level. And I said, that's witchcraft, and I'm telling Jesus. <laughs> because that sprinkler was not there. You just whipped that thing up, 
uh, all of a sudden because I know I didn't walk by that thing three times and didn't see it. it happens all the time. I, I'm just not good. See, I mean, there's things that we're just not good at. And, and that's some weakness. That's an inability. All right, here's another one, iniquity. Now, iniquity is a, is a big Bible word, um, and it has to do with sin. So an iniquity is, well, let me give you a couple of verses with it in there, and then, and then I'll, I'll, I'll identify it for you. David says in Psalm 51, verse 5, Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Now, this does not mean that David's mother was committing some sexual sin when she conceived him. It means that from the time he was conceived, he was a sinner. But it says that iniquity shaped him, and that's what iniquity does. It shapes us. Look in Deuteronomy chapter 5, another verse. This actually is the second command, part of the second commandment. The first one is, don't have any other gods before me. The second one is, don't build any idols. This is part of that. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for the Lord your God, for, for, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. So, the, word, the, the Hebrew word avon, and it's not important that you remember that, but the Hebrew word avon is most often translated iniquity. And the word has to do with your inner character. And it has to do with what shapes your inner character. And the word iniquity deals with uh, an intentional twisting of a, of a standard, like like a moral value or, or a, a, a law of God or uh, something to do with uh, vir being virtuous. And, and there's clearly established rules about that. Well, iniquity means that someone takes that rule and twists it just enough so that they can feel comfortable doing it even though it's wrong. So it is a sin to change those set standards. You know, you can't just make up your own rules, right? So when that happens to you, it's called iniquity, and it has to do with the fact that all of us are shaped by the environment that we grew up in. That's just why it's the iniquity of the fathers. The fathers started bending the rules and it's now gone down to the third and fourth generation. In every generation, what was probably some kind of privilege for this generation, they broke the rule. They just, I mean, it was just a little bit. We didn't do anything terrible. It was just a little bit. Well, by the time you get down to the third and fourth generations, those people are in bondage down there because of the twisting of that standard. That's what iniquity is. So all of us have been brought up in an environment, in our families, that control, to some extent, the way we act now. And an iniquity is a weakness because it, 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 it controls how you might respond to a similar situation. A as an example, as an example, let's say you grew up in a family that um, sexual sin was not even um, an item. They live together, no thought about, hey, you don't need to worry about getting married. That's, that's, you know, we love each other and all that. And, and, and what they uh, brought around, what they looked at, what they watched on TV, what they carried out. I mean, the way they j lived lifestyle was just that sexual situations were not anything to really, that was, you know, we didn't need to have any morality about that kind of stuff. Well, what would that do to you? Well, what that would do to you is it would let you grow up where you don't sense any restrictions about those kind of things. And that means you would have that kind of an environment in your home, and then your children would be brought up in that environment. And every time you, you go to a generation, it just gets deeper and deeper and deeper. Or it could be something like anger. You grow up in an angry home. Everybody's hollering, yelling. Everybody's mad in the house all over the place. Well, you're shaped by that. And it means that most likely with your family, you're going to be angry too or prejudiced. You grow up in a prejudiced home. 
man, everything is, you know, black and white, whatever, whichever group we're prejudiced against. Uh, and by the way, every, every group of people has somebody they're prejudiced against for the most part. Uh, if, you, if you go around America, it's not always the same people, believe me. But anyway, let's say you grow up in a prejudice home. Then your home, then your, 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 your value system is shaped by prejudice. And you're likely going to be prejudiced. Unless you break this, the stronghold of this iniquity. And once you break the stronghold of this iniquity, then it breaks it off of your children and your grandchildren and all the generations that come after. Because you intentionally said, I am not going to be controlled by, my, by the iniquity of my past. I know what the truth is. I know what God says it is. And I'm gonna live by the truth. And you break that thing off and, and, and away you'll go. Uh, I'll give you an example. My family, my, my grandparents. My grandfather died when he fell out of a porch swing, turned over backwards because he was so drunk he couldn't stand up. All of my daddy's brothers died in, in alcohol-related accidents, incidences, and diseases. I grew up in my whole family was alcoholics. Well, I got saved when I was 16 years old, thank the Lord, because I was probably headed right at that. Not only that, but criminal activity and so forth. But God came to me and, and thank goodness he could run faster than I could because I was running away from him as fast as I could go, but he, he just overtook me and <laughs> he saved my soul and, and changed my life. Well, now, no longer could I look at a, uh, a habit or whatever you want to call alcoholism that controls your life and, and say, that's okay. I said, hey, that's not going to be me. That's, that's the end. I, I never touched. Uh, no, that's not going to be my life. And so because I broke that iniquity, my family now, my children... And my grandchildren, not saying that they don't ever drink or, or, would, or couldn't become alcoholics, but that, that bondage is broken. Now, if they had grown up with me continuing that bondage, they most likely would be continuing it, and they would be that way, and so would my grandchildren. That's what iniquity is. So iniquity then becomes a weakness. Now, I put, I've got a slide on how to break it. Let me give you four. I'm going to give them real quick. This is how you do all right, first, you have to admit it and take responsibility for it. Regardless of how you got it, it's your issue now. You've heard the old line, and I know somebody, some of you kind of hate that. It is what it is. Well, it is what it is. So, it, I, I mean, whether it came from your parents or came from your grandparents, whatever, it doesn't matter. It's yours now. So you got to own it, and you got to admit it. You got to say, this is, this is, a, this is, a, this is an iniquity. And this is not right. We're going to do something about it. Number two, forgive your offender. Because most likely, they were brought up in the same manner that they brought you up. And, if, and, and I mean, if you can tell me about your parents, I'll tell you about your grandparents. Uh, give them a little grace. Hey, they were brought up like this, and they probably didn't hear what you're hearing. So they didn't know they could break this stuff. Give them a little grace. Number three, break that stronghold in the name of Jesus. Understand that when you break iniquity off of your life, you're breaking it off the life of your children and grandchildren and, and, and the following generations. And you need to decide. You say, all right, I'm gonna decide right here, all of these iniquities in my life in right here. And I'm breaking those things off of my life and off my children's life, my grandchildren's life. And here's the way you do it. You, you, for, you, it, it's a determination in your heart that this is wrong and I'm not going to live this way anymore. This is not, this is, I don't care who did it. I, I, I'm not going to live this way anymore. And I'm breaking this thing off my life. And, and here's all you need to say. We break this iniquity off our lives and declare that this bent is going to become straight. In Jesus' name, amen. You don't have to, it's not the Gettysburg Address. You don't have to learn some big formula. It's just basically saying, Lord, 
this is it. I got it. I don't want it. I'm giving it to you. And then number four, surrender it to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That just means uh, let Jesus start controlling your life in these areas. How do you get bent in the first place? Well, you get bent in the first place because of, uh, of disobedience and, and rebellion. So break that bent and your whole family can be changed. All right, let me move on. Number three, third type of, of, of weakness is infirmity. That's another Bible word. You hear it all the time. Asthenia is the uh, Greek word for infirmity, and it just means uh, lack of strength. It means weakness. It means uh, frail, a frailty in your life. And you, you hear it, the Apostle Paul talked about it, about the infirmities in his life, and he's just talking about something that is a weakness, that is a frailty, that's not strong. Now, for some, sometimes the infirmity may be a temporary deal, and then sometimes it may be a lifelong deal like, like Paul had. Uh, Second Corinthians, we read it. Uh, I'm just calling attention back to it. Look at verse seven. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations, a thorn in my flesh was given me, a messenger of Satan, to buffet me lest I should be exalted above measure. Now, no one knows exactly what this thorn in the flesh was, but it was something physical, Paul talks about it. It's, it. It hindered him. It was a it was a thorn, and he called it a thorn in his flesh. And and even though we don't know exactly what it was, Paul did tell the Galatians in Galatians chapter four. Paul said to them, "When I was with you, I was with you because I was sick." And then he went on to say, "And I know that you would have you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me if you could." So. I'm just thinking it was probably his eyes that was the problem. Paul couldn't see good, and it, and it, it hindered his life. So it, it could have been that Paul had an eye problem, and that was his physical problem. So sometimes we have physical infirmities that God heals, and sometimes God says, no, I, I'm, I'm not healing that. My grace is sufficient for you. And that is perplexing and frustrating, and it's hard to live with. But... I'm not God, so I didn't make the rule. Number four, the fourth type of weakness. Here's the last one. Inherent weakness. I knew you'd like that. Why inherent? Well, because it starts with an I, just like the other ones. <laughs> and in, <laughs> inherent means the kind of weakness that accompanies being a human being. It means that we, all of us humans are born out of dust, we, uh, the scripture says, the Lord pities his children for he remembers that we are dust. So inherent weakness is weakness that God builds into us. Like the apostle Paul, maybe, maybe like the apostle Paul. Um, you were built with a need that would cause you to seek God on a regular basis. I mean, this thorn in the flesh caused Paul to have to really totally depend on God way more than if he could see and, and go about business and use his own strength. And so these inherent weaknesses can be some of the most difficult weaknesses that we have to face because they're, they're so, you know, it's like, God, what, you know, what is this? Why am I like this? You know, it's just perplexing. Let me give you some, a scriptural example of this. Here's some inherent weakness. Uh, the, one of the main characters of the Old Testament is, is Moses. Moses is the one who God sends down to Egypt to get Israel and bring them to the promised land. Well, when God spoke to Moses about doing this, it was out in the middle of the desert on the backside of nowhere. And a bush started burning and Moses said, let me see why that bush is burning. And when he got close enough, the bush started talking, but it was, it was God. And uh, he said, Moses, take your shoes off because you're on holy ground. And he said, uh, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go down to Egypt and I want you to talk to Pharaoh and I want you to say, let my people go. And what was Moses' first excuse? His first excuse was, God, I don't talk so good. I don't know if Moses stuttered. I don't know if he had a speech impediment. And I don't want to make fun of either one of those. That's hurtful. But whatever it was, Moses said, God, I don't talk good. 
And what did God say to Moses? Moses, who made your mouth? Implying that, hey, I made your mouth just like I want it to be made. You talk just like I designed you to talk. Now, you would think that if you were going to design someone who in, the, who in their lifetime, they were going to be the deliverer of an entire nation of people by going to an evil Pharaoh and saying things to him that would impress him to let those people go, you would think that God would have created him to be able to talk eloquently. But the one thing Moses said, God, I would do it, but I can't talk, man. You didn't build me to be able to talk. Now, why wouldn't God build Moses so he was a good talker? Because God didn't want some slick talker going down there to Egypt and pulling a fast one on the Pharaoh and all the people say, that Moses is such a salesman, he could sell, you know, uh, ice to Eskimo. And he, got, he just talked Pharaoh right out of this. We were on our way out because Moses is a good talker. No, God wanted to use signs and wonders to deliver the people. And he wanted Moses to depend on him for everything he would say and everything he would do. So he created Moses with an inherent weakness. All right, let's go to the New Testament. One of the strongest men, and I said it before, besides Jesus in the New Testament was the Apostle Paul. Well, the Apostle Paul has already said that he wasn't a good talker, <laughs> you know. And, and I'm thinking, all right, God, if you're going to create someone who is going to write uh, a good bit of the New Testament, of the 27 books of the New Testament, and he's going to start churches all over the known world at the time, it would seem to me that you would make him a good talker, captivating maybe even, so that it could help him in his ministry. But look, here, look, look at what Paul says. This is 1 Corinthians 2. And I, brethren, this is the testimony of someone with an inherent weakness that God built into him, and look at what it caused. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So sometimes God disables an area of your life so that you must depend on him. Your weaknesses have a far greater potential to bring glory to God than your strength. You know why? Because in those areas that you're strong, you have a real big tendency to depend on yourself. That's exactly, pat yourself. I, you know, I know, it's, I know it's frustrating, but there are areas of our life that sometimes God has to shut off. I mean, at least, at least for a period of time. And we want to look at him and say, God, why in the world would you do that? Don't you know I need that? And God looks down and says, you don't need that. You need me. But you're dependent on that, so I, I'm shutting that down. Let me give you my magic wand theory. All right, now this is going to sound, I'm not promoting witchcraft or anything. This is just an illustration. But, and, 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 and give it a chance to set in before you start disagreeing with what I'm saying. Because we all, you know, have different opinions about spiritual things and we, never mind, let me just tell you what the theory is. I'm arguing with myself. <laughs> now I'm talking to myself right out of it. I don't think I'll share this. All right, let's suppose... I had a magic wand. I had a bunch of magic wands. And I could give each of you a magic wand. And, I, and, and this magic wand now, it could really do this. It, if you wave this wand over yourself, whatever was wrong with you, whatever weakness you had, whether it was physical, emotional, spiritual, financial, uh, whatever it was that was a weakness in you, you just wave this magic wand over yourself and it would be fixed. The theory, my, my theory is that the moment 
you waved that magic wand over yourself, you would never need God again. Now, listen to what I'm saying. I know you're already saying, oh, pastor, I love God. No, no, no. Just listen to what I'm saying here. Because you would never need God again because it is those very things that you would fix about yourself that most of the time, much of the time, bring you into the presence of God. God uses those things. I mean, think about what you pray about. God, I need that money. I score it. Man, I don't have enough money and my kids are suffering. God, please. Or this job, Lord, I need, a, I need a promotion on this thing. This is just something. Or my roof is leaking. God, I don't know how we're going to make it, but God, you do. And you. I mean, think about the things you pray about. That would be what you would fix with the wand. And then you'd never want to talk to God again. Because it's the things you need that bring you into the presence of God most of the time. So there's a big difference between the way God looks at weaknesses and the way humans look at weaknesses. Humans look at weaknesses and say that they are a liability. Like, like the group in, in 1 Corinthians 10, uh, the people say um, his letters are good, but in person he's a dud. So it's a liability. God looks at weaknesses as an opportunity for him to show himself mighty in our behalf. To the same weakness that the people said, uh, his letters are good, but he's a dud. Here's what God said, verse 8, 2 Corinthians 12. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. In other words, God says, cause I show up when you can't do it. So that's how he looks at, at weaknesses in life. And your weaknesses and, and God's strengths are a perfect match is what I'm saying. You know, it may sound strange, but God is not turned off at all by your weaknesses. God is attracted to your weaknesses. The devil wants to convince you that God is up in heaven right now being repulsed by your weaknesses. God's up there saying, can't you be stronger? Can't you be a better person? Can't you perform better? Can't you do, be more consistent in life? And the answer is, no, I can't. That's why I need grace. And the... And, and, and so you can't give away what you don't have. And in order to, to be gracious, uh, to have grace, you, you have to be gracious. I mean, it, if, you, if you don't live a life of grace yourself, then you're not going to be gracious to anybody else. You're going to expect them to perform just like you're expected to perform. And when they don't perform up to the expectations that you expect them to, uh, uh, to perform, then you're going to be just as cruel to them as they are to you. But if you live a life of grace, it's easy to extend grace to others who are not perfect and have actual weaknesses in your life. But you can't give it away if you don't have it. The world we live in right now is just like that. The world we live in is you perform good, we give, we, we give you some respect. You don't perform good, we're going to uh, uh, cancel you, you know. And my point of that is that that's not the way God is at all. God is not a performance-based God. He is a God that is full of grace, full of mercy, Forgiveness. I mean, this is how he describes himself. So when God looks at your weakness, his response is, will you let me into your weakness? Will you let me be the strength to that weakness of yours? But, but of course, uh, you won't let God in if you don't see him this way. Because... You can't get closer to God than your concept of God will allow you to. And for you to receive the grace of God, 
and dispense the grace of God. You have to let God in. You have to see him the way that he is and trust him. All right, that'll be enough for today. Is that good? Next week, I'm gonna preach the other half of this sermon. There's another half. Anyway, bow your head with me, all right?